Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be looking at the Hobby Boss F105D in 1 to 48 scale. So, I hope you enjoy and let's get into it. So, this model began in the cockpit like most models these days. I initially started with the chair. The chair has got some relatively nice detail. However, I'd say the construction of the chair is a little bit fiddly. So I definitely recommend taking your time here, as the cockpit is quite small, alignment is key. You have no room to spare at all. So talking a little bit more about the construction of the chair, as you can see initially you build this sort of frame for the chair, uh, which generally goes together quite well with the exception of the front two legs. I had a little bit of a fit issue there, but I managed to sort that out all a okay. Then you move on to adding a couple more additional details such as the cushions and the headrest. I think this was quite a good idea from Hobby Boss as it allows them to make sure that each individual piece is sufficiently detailed. Here you can see me using Tamiya's extra thin cement. I use this for the majority of the build as it is quick setting and relatively strong. Here you can see me moving on to a bit of the cockpit construction. Generally the construction here was very simple as there was only a few items to be placed on, such as the control panels as you can see here. These control panels feature some really nice raised detail which are going to look brilliant when they're dry brushed later. It was then time to paint some of these cockpit items. I firstly went with painting the chair, however the cockpit and also the cockpit back wall was also followed in this light gold grey. Once I felt that all of the items had been properly covered in the grey, I then went on to some detail work. I initially started with this dark khaki green for the cushions, followed by some red for the headrest. If anyone could tell me why this was painted red, it would be thoroughly appreciated. It was then time to put this deck out onto the instrument panel. This was done with a lot of microset and microsole. Whenever I'm using microset and microsole, I always like to have a cotton bud nearby to make sure I can press the deck out into all of the details. Continuing on the theme of detail painting, it was then time to pick out a couple of these control panels with black. Once I was happy with my painting of the control panels, I looked at the chair again, this time highlighting some of the seat belts, buckles and other elements on the chair. For seat belts, I always use Tamiya's trusty buff colour, as I believe it has the most realistic tone. I then used a cocktail stick to pick out some of the buckles and other places where chipping would maybe occur on the seat. This was done I believe with Vallejo Silver. After I was happy with the progress made on the seat, it was time to look at some of the raised details that I discussed earlier in the cockpit. These are all dry brushed and highlighted using a gull grey colour again. My tip for dry brushing is to make sure you have hardly any paint on your brush beforehand. You can get rid of any excess paint by either brushing it very lightly on some paper or an old paper towel. After I'd finished dry brushing and the cockpit was coming to a close, I personally thought the cockpit still looked a little bit too clean for my liking, so I used an oil wash to make it look a little bit more dirty. Once the oil wash had been allowed to set for a couple minutes, I used a new cotton bud and wiped off any excess to give this dirty, grimy effect. Perhaps I went a little bit too over the top on this effect, as I don't think it's very realistic, but I was very happy with the outcome. I repeated this process on the seat as well. It was then time to bring everything together. To fit the chair, I used PVA glue as it's less harmful to the cockpit and allows me more time to get the fitment correct. After that had dried, this was the finished product. I was very happy with how this turned out. It was then time to move on to the engine. Hobby Boss provide a really well detailed engine for this kit. However, they don't provide any proper way to display it, which I found really quite confusing. Also, the engine was severely over-engineered. It just had too many pieces and it felt like an eternity building this engine. Lots of seams, lots of parts, and just a generally confusing piece to make. This led me to lose a little bit of motivation to paint the engine as firstly it wouldn't have been seen and also I wanted to get on some more interesting parts of the build. I'm sure if you spent a lot of time on this you could produce a really nice looking engine, however you don't see it so I don't see the point in that. When it came to painting the exhaust I like to put down an initial coat of a steel or polished metal followed by dusting it with a little bit of rusted uh, iron. 
This just gave the sort of worn effect which I was looking for and I was quite happy with the outcome. And here was the final outcome, definitely not my finest piece of work but it gets the job done and also it won't be seen. So now moving on to the nose wheel gear bay, this generally had no problems when being put together however you have to think ahead uh, whether you're going to have the nose gear out when you're painting or whether you only assemble half of it like I did and then assemble the other half at the end. It's a choice that you get to make, but if you choose the first option, it just means a little bit more masking for you and you have to be a little bit more careful not to break it off. However, both work equally as well. It was then time to move on to putting a couple of these items into the main fuselage. There are some brilliant and really tight location pins here, which means that it's no issue whatsoever fitting the cockpit, nose will be, and also the engine. The only issue I slightly ran into was with the nose wheel bay. The location plot was a little bit warped, so it just needed a little bit of correction there. But once I'd sorted that out, snapped in with no issue whatsoever. So no complaints. Once all of that was put together, it was time to meet the two fuselage halves. As you'll see, the engine does stick out the back. I thought I had done something really badly wrong, but no, there are just about three different segments to this fuselage, which um, is, is, is a mixed bag of opinions from me. After the two fuselage halves were put together, there were a couple of items which had to be put onto the actual fuselage. Here you can see me putting on the panels for the refueling probe. These are really, really fiddly, and if I had the chance to redo this kit, I definitely do it in the refueling probe in the open position just so I wouldn't have to deal with this because this took me about 30 minutes to get it right. Once I was finished with that fiddly task it was time to go on to the latter end of the fuselage. Here I am fitting what I believe is the arrestor hook but please do correct me if I'm wrong. It was then time to move on to the wings. So Hobby Boss do give you the ability to put the speed brakes in the extended position. However, I did opt to have them in the closed position. This is purely because a lot of these pieces did have eject pin marks on the underneath and I didn't really want to sand them off. So I just fitted them in the retracted position instead. It was actually a very satisfying process doing all of these because all of these had a really nice fit, uh, but it did just take a little bit of time. Continuing with the wing, it was time to assemble the underside where the gear bay is. I only really had to put two or three parts into this, which was interesting. However, I felt it lacked a little bit of detail and looked a little bit plain. However, this was jazzed up later by just picking out some details with a couple of different colors. Here you can see me sanding off some of the eject pin marks which might have been visible uh, in the intakes. However, now that the model is finished and looking at it now, I don't think these would have been visible, but it was better to be safe than sorry. I did then go on to meet the two pieces of the wing. These generally had a really nice fit and didn't have too many seams which needed to be taken care of. I then moved on to looking at these flapperons or flaps. I'm not too sure, please do tell me what they are down below. Uh, these should have been fitted before I met the two pieces, but they did manage to just about snap in beforehand. I did then also opt to have these in the down position or extended position just to add a little bit of interest to the model. The same process happened with the ailerons on the outer sides of the wing. Here you can see me assembling some slats. Um, these were quite tricky to put together just because they're, they're very long and skinny and just, uh, just a bit awkward. However, I thought it was weird to have these as a separate part when there was no ability to make them extended or just why not put them molded into the wing by itself. So a little bit of an odd choice there and you see this underlying theme with the rest of the kit that they're just putting parts in there for the sake of putting parts. So I think the correct word for this is saying that it's over engineered. Anyway, moving back to the build, here you can see me addressing some seams which were on the inner side of the intake this was just done by using a little bit of Lejo's putty and uh, swiping it down the inside. 
It was then time to meet these two or four pieces of the fuselage together. This was done by slipping this latter end over the engine and onto the end. As you can see there, a pretty dreadful fit which did need to be addressed as you can see here with a little bit of putty and also a lot of priming and sanding and all that sort of stuff. But uh, I didn't film that as I thought it would be quite boring but all I do have to say about it is it was a bit of an issue. But when those issues were resolved, it was plain sailing from there. As you can see here, all the tail and all of the uh, rudder and everything uh, went together absolutely brilliantly. No issue whatsoever. Uh, and it was actually a really enjoyable build from there. So as you can see now, I'm just going around the model adding a few of these external pieces, uh, such as the elevators, which you can see here, and a couple of air intakes or whatever those other pieces were. The elevators went on quite nicely, however the only criticism I do have is that they have quite small contact points and I did break off both of them while painting them, but a bit of super glue and they went on back together, no issue whatsoever. I did have to make sure to maintain the dihedral that they do have though. It was then time to continue on putting a couple of antennas intakes around the model. I had no issue with fitment here and if I did I'm sure I could have just cut off the locating pin and stuck it on with a bit of a butt joint. After this last piece had been fitted, I did prime the entire model in black. This was done using Ammo's one shot primer, I believe it's Ammo's. Um, and once that was done, I did just have to fit the HUD heads up display onto the inner side of the canopy before I fitted it on. I'm once again seen using PVA glue here. This was just to minimize any risk of fogging up the plastic. I didn't purchase any Edward masks or masks from any other manufacturer, I instead just used my old trusty masking tape and a cocktail strick, strick stick to mask off any of the plastic. This once again worked to treat and then these were attached to the model using PVA glue again. I know you can see a lot of excess squirting out there, however this was cleaned up using cotton bud. I then repeated my masking tape and cocktail stick trick for the masking for the other pieces of the canopy. So I then went on to start doing my mottle effect. I have used my mottle effect in previous builds. I used it on my Airfix 148 Hawker Hunter. However, what this is, is pretty much creating tonal variation for the underside of the model. You'll see it in a later clip. And this is just done by a very low PSI and white paint being sprayed. It's a very random pattern and doesn't have to be perfect. This is why I've heard lots of people say that your mottling has to be perfect to make it look good. No, mottling can be random, however you do just want to keep it in a little bit of a linear form. As you can see from this clip, the F105 has an awful lot of panels, so the mottling process did take a very long time, however I was very happy with the outcome, so no harm done. I have seen people recently start mottling using other colours than white mostly greens and yellows. I think I'm gonna try this at some point as sometimes the white is quite harsh. I recently did see someone model an F18 using this sort of, uh, an interior green sort of color and it came out with some much more subtle and probably more realistic color variation. So hopefully you will see that in upcoming builds as I, is a technique which I'm very, very up for trying. Over recent projects, I've started to remove my needle or nozzle cover from my airbrush. This has just allowed me to get a little bit closer to the model and just gives me much more control over the, the shapes that I make and also the intensity of the paint on the model. However, this does mean I have to be extra careful not to damage the needle. So it was finally time to start putting some color down onto the model. I was going to freehand my camouflage, so what I initially did would um, very very lightly create a sort of template or a sketch for where I wanted this certain colour to go as you can see in this clip and then I would fill in the other panels. When doing this I was making sure not to go too heavy on my initial coats of paint as I'm a little bit notorious for going too heavy on initial coats and destroying all of my work that I did on mottling. So talking a little bit about the paints that I used for this, um, I used a Vallejo model air war set, I, something like that, but one of their paint sets. This one was the Vietnamese one. 
a little bit of a mixed bag for me um, I don't think I'll be using them again purely because as you'll see the um, the two greens the two tones of greens that the US Vietnamese aircraft did use um, it, they were just too similar and there was no variation whatsoever between the two colors so my three tone camouflage kind of turned into a two tone camouflage and at the time of recording this I didn't have a suitable green to um, replace it so I just kind of had to grin and bear it and it means that I will not be using one of their paint sets again however the actual paints they um, are airbrush ready and they do spray really nicely so maybe for individual colors I, I would happily use them again but I will not be purchasing one of their paint sets again However, that is enough negativity about the Vallejo paint set. Talking more about the painting process, I did have the included Hobby Boss paint sheet, I guess we can call it, next to me and I was just trying to cross reference from there onto the model. The paint sheet was relatively hard to kind of navigate though, so it, it did take a little bit of a thought process and a bit of thinking power, however I got it done in the end and I was actually very happy with how it looked in the end. So as the tan was then finished, it was time to look at the green again. This used the exact same process as the tan color, however, this time with green. I followed the exact same process of sketching an outline of where the uh, green will follow and then filling it in with the lighter coats. When I was spraying with these colors and whenever I'm spraying for that matter, uh, doing freehand camouflage, I like to tone down the um, air pressure a little bit so instead of spraying at my usual sort of 20 to 25 psi I spray at about 15 or 10 to 15 psi for that matter. Whenever I'm building a kit I always like to have something on in the background to fill the silence uh, and quite fittingly I've been watching and when I was building this kit I was watching a new series on channel 4 called Warbird Workshop it's a it's a brilliant series um, and when I was doing this they came out with an episode about the bird dog which was famously used in Vietnam uh, for helping coordinate airstrikes so it, it was interesting just to um, be building something from the same era uh, but it's a brilliant series and I cannot recommend it enough so I hope you watch it Moving back to the build, here you can see the two greens. Although they might look slightly, uh, the one on the right might look slightly lighter, when they dry, they are the exact same color. And it, I, I felt a little bit scammed, if I'm being honest with you. However, it was just something to go with and it meant that I didn't have to be as careful going around the um, borders, so it might have sped up my build a little bit. As I'm sat here editing this footage, the only difference I can see in the two paints is perhaps perhaps sorry, the opacity in the paint. The second paint just seems to be a little bit lighter and a bit more see-through. Uh, but yeah, not, not the best here and I, as I said before, I won't be purchasing one of these Vallejo air sets ever again. After all the camo had been done, it was time to move on to the underside. This was done in the uh, gull grey colour as you can see on screen. Not too much to say about this other than it sprayed down really nicely and it had nice coverage properties. You can also see here that I had painted the gear bay in the uh, white colour. Uh, there was a little bit of debate here when I was um, painting this as I had seen images of F-105s with white gear bays and F-105s with interior green gear bays. So it was almost just like toss a coin and just choose one. And for the sake of not having to do as much masking, I went with the white. So interestingly, the border from camouflage to the underside color isn't linear the whole way around. So it's completely random and wavy. So one side isn't the same. I was completely unaware of this and thought it was pretty interesting. So it was then time to try out a new technique on this model. Here you can see me re-going over the panels with the buff colour and remodeling the panels. This is to give a faded effect which is evident on so many of the Vietnamese aircraft, especially the F-105s. 
to do this I did the exact same process as what I did with the white mottling however this time I made sure I sprayed a little bit further away and made it a little bit softer. When scrolling through Instagram I have seen many modelers actually leave their models like this once done and I do actually quite like how it looks however I, I just thought it looked too faded, too faded for my liking. However, uh, it's definitely a very striking model when it's like this. So as I mentioned, it was too much for me. So to revert this effect, all I did was re um, put in some of the uh, green color and very lightly dust over it just to, just to dull the, the effect back a bit. To add some variation to the model and some interest to the model, when I was respraying this green, I would focus paint in a couple of areas just to either revert the effect a bit more or a little bit less. And it also gave me a chance to sh uh, t tighten up, uh, sharpen up, sorry, a couple of the panel and uh, camouflage lines as they were a little, a little bit on the soft side in a couple of places. And the Vietnamese aircraft, they were always very, very sharp lined. It was nice to try a new effect and then that was the painting done for me. Moving on to fitting the uh, incredibly unique um, exhaust onto this aircraft, I once again used uh, PVA glue. This was just so I made sure I didn't damage any of the paintwork. I somehow managed to lose the footage of me um, painting up the exhaust, so I guess I'll just have to explain about it instead. So I initially gave them a coating of the polished metal and then I came in with some clear blue, red and yellow paint just to try and create this uh, sort of heat burn uh, effect. And I think it came out quite well as you'll see in the final pictures. So if you do get this kit, please get the metal landing gear. These landing gear are not up to it. This is a big model and they cannot and I repeat, they cannot hold the model. I had an absolute, the biggest headache trying to figure this out. Thank you to everyone on Instagram who helped me um, resolve the issue. And the issue was resolved by just doing a small pool of super glue. Um, but these, these, these landing gear are horrific. So please get a metal landing gear if you are to do this kit. With my little run over the rest of the model, all of these gear doors were fitted with PVA glue once again to make sure I didn't damage any of the paintwork even though it had been given a semi-gloss varnish. So the final bit before I put the decals on was the gun. The gun wasn't the greatest, uh, maybe a little bit due to my error, however the, um, the barrels just they were really flimsy and I broke one of two. Right so before we move on these decals were a little bit saucy to say the least so i've tried my best to block it all out however parental guidance is advised so decals did go on like any other decal they were actually very nice decals nice and thin and uh, very strong so pretty much what i did was uh, layer it up with a little bit of micro set and then place the decal and micro sole use the cotton bud wipe it over, make sure it conformed into the details very well. But yeah, overall, very happy with Hobby Boss decals. This is my first Hobby Boss kit, so I'm not, I wasn't really too sure what to think of it. However, they're nice and vibrant, nice and strong, nice and thin, so I am not complaining whatsoever. So as the final decal was placed down, it's time to talk about the radar. So I would like to display the radar in this kit purely because I haven't done it before and it was quite a nice looking uh, radar. 
Uh, however, the contact point to try and attach a rather big nose to like two small places, it just it just wasn't enough. So to do this, I had to use a bit of engineering and put a bit of wire through it, and uh, that just gave me the support that I needed. I then went on to demasking all of the uh, canopy. This was very very satisfying, uh, but as you'll see in a second, I did make a slight mistake. So here was my mistake, PVA has so many benefits, however strength is not one of them. However, a bit more PVA sorted that right out. And with the final bit of the canopy put on, this model was finished. So on to the final photos. So as we're now going through the final photos of this kit, I think it's an appropriate time to say a big thank you to Harry. Harry actually sent me this kit to be built and I I can't thank him enough for it. So I hope you enjoy the final photos and I hope to see you again soon. Bye bye.